President, fellows and guests, good evening. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about Apethorpe Hall, or Apethorpe Palace, as it's recently been renamed. Um, sometimes pronounced Apthorpe. Um, I'm going to stick with Apethorpe because it's the way I've been describing it for the last 13 years. And, um, but forgive me if I switch between Apethorpe and Apthorpe. I shall try not to. Um, but um, habits die hard. Apethorpe in Northamptonshire is a country house best known for its important suite of rooms of 1622 to 4 and for its close association with King James I, who visited the house on 11 occasions and is said to have met his favourite, George Villiers, later the Duke of Buckingham there in 1614. Less well known is the story of how the house came to be built around 1470 by a Yorkist courtier, Guy Wollstone, and the piecemeal development of the building from that date until 1551, when the house was acquired by an up-and-coming government official, Sir Walter Mildmay, and subsequently enlarged by him and his descendants. It's that early period in the de development of the house that's the focus of this paper this evening. Wollstone's house survives substantially intact and forms the core of the present-day building. Um, so here's the house, and this is the hall range, uh, and this is the north range with the gatehouse here. Um, here's the village, and there's Apethorpe Church. In the absence of any late 15th or early 16th century documentary references to the house, much of what I shall be describing this evening is derived from a detailed investigation of the building's fabric. English Heritage, now Historic England, carried out a major research programme at Apethorpe in the period 2001 to 13. A great deal of the work was undertaken once access became possible following the compulsory purchase of the house by the government in 2004 to prevent it from collapse and loss following a long period of near complete abandonment. The research investigation, um, as the President has said, was brought together in a monograph, Apethorpe, the Story of an English Country House, published by Yale University Press in association with Historic England last year. And there is a display copy of the book um, outside in the vestibule, uh, an order form, should you wish to purchase. It's uh, available through that order form at a very special price of £40 instead of the usual £60, with free postage and packing. So it's a very good deal. <laughs> The research and the book were very much a team effort, and I'd like to thank my co-authors, Catherine Morrison, e em Emily Cole, Nick Hill, and Pete Smith, uh, some of, most of whom are here this evening, for their thoughts and insights on the early history of the house. The research at Apethorpe took place alongside and helped inform a sizable program of repairs to the house, and culminated in its sale to a private, a private owner Jean-Christophe Isieux, Baron von Fetten, in 2014. As a condition of the sale, the house is open to the public by English Heritage so that people can watch the continuing restoration of the building by the new owners. The house lies on the southern edge of the village of Apethorpe in northeastern Northamptonshire. Importantly, in terms of understanding why the house came to be built where it is, Apethorpe was located in the Bailiwick of Cliff, one of the three administrative divisions within the Royal Forest of Rockingham, which by the mid-15th century had been greatly reduced through clearance. 1.4 miles to the north was the King's Manor of Cliff, today known as King's Cliff, while importantly for this story, 2.6 miles to the southeast lay the family home of the ruling York dynasty at Fotheringhay Castle. And Fothering Hay, there's Apethorpe in the green, and there's Fothering Hay. The village is surrounded by good arable land that has been farmed since the Iron Age. There is strong evidence for Romano British occupation of the area, highlighted, highlighted by the discovery of foundations of a Romano British villa with mosaic floors 500 metres south of the house in 1859. Overlaying this are medio medieval open fields with remains of ridge and furrow cultivation, respecting an established ancient trackway, 
which runs north to south on the west side of the house and is one of the oldest surviving features in the landscape. This uh, 1947 aerial photograph um, shows some of those features. So down here at A is the site of the, this is the house here. Here is the site of the Roman villa. Um, here, are, here, is, here are the um, uh, medieval field systems at C. And B is the um, ancient trackway that I mentioned that runs up past the house and on up in this direction. Apethorpe formed part of an Anglo-Saxon royal estate and a manor continued to be held by the crown after the Norman conquest, with a tenancy being granted to various individuals for services rendered and at other times taken back into royal hands, either as a punishment or to augment the exchequer. There is little evidence that any of these tenants lived at Apethorpe, with the possible exception of a Sir Richard Dalton, who in the early 15th century may have occupied a manor house described in the mid-16th century as in ruins. It was probably located, located close to the church. Indeed, Dalton may well have been responsible for the construction of St. Leonard's Church, which we know, now know from dendrochronology was built in the period 12, 4, 1412 to 37, rather than in the late 15th century as previously supposed. A variety of dates have been put forward for the construction of the house. 19th century historians and land, land agents ascribed it to the mid 13th century on the basis of a fireplace of that date which no longer exists. This fireplace was located above the dairy in the service wing, which you can see um, on the right hand side of the slide, which was built by Wollstone uh, around 1476. It's highly likely to, the fireplace is highly likely to have come from elsewhere, either the earlier manor house or Fotheringhay Castle, which was demolished in the 17th century. Lady Rose Weigel, a granddaughter of the 11th Earl of Westmoreland, thought that the builder of the house was her ancestor, Sir Walter Mildmay, while J.A. Gotch attributed, attributed it to the Dalton family in the early 15th century. All of these writers seem not to have had access to an account of the history of the house produced by a local clergyman, the Reverend Henry K. Bonney, in about 1828, whose account was evident, evidently based on access to architectural drawings and an investigation of the fabric of the house itself. It was Bonney who correctly identified the builder as Guy Woolston. And this is one of a series of six watercolours by a Bedford artist called Bradford Rudge. And it shows uh, uh, an imaginary Elizabethan scene, but it shows the um, view inside the main courtyard. Um, but what everything, virtually everything that's in that picture is actually part of the Wollstone House, um, obviously much earlier than the Elizabethan period. In the late 20th century, the history of the house was further refined in the 1984 RCHME inventory volume and by Hewitt and Taylor in their book, The Country Houses of Northamptonshire. So who was Guy Wollstone, and how did he come to build his new house on the outskirts of Apethorpe Village? He was born around 1435, and was a son of William Wollstone, Esquire, of Hall Manor, Wollaston, Northamptonshire, which lies 22 miles south of Apethorpe. William was a member of the household of Richard Plantagenet, 3rd Duke of York, claimant to the English throne and the richest of the king's subjects. As a young man, William Wollstone had served Richard's uncle, Edward, second Duke of York, the founder of Fotheringhay College, who died at Agincourt in 1415. To be close to the Duke's principal seat, from 1429 to 1447, William Wollstone leased Alton Hall, shown here, less than two miles east of Fotheringhay, and it was at Alton that Guy Wilson was likely to have been raised. While living at Alton, William Wilson was joint signatory with Thomas Peckham, clerk and master of Fotheringhay College, to an agreement made on behalf of the Duke with William Horwood, a mason of Fotheringhay, to build the nave, aisles and west tower of the collegiate church at Fotheringhay. And what you see here is, is basically what was set out in that contract. The earlier part of the church, which was basically the, the chancel area, had been, um, was demolished in the 1570s. 
In the contract, William Wollstone is described as a commissary or deputy of Richard of York. His status as a senior and trusted member of the magnate's household was confirmed two years later when with eight senior figures he was invested as a trustee in of, array, in a, of an array of castles, lordships and manors held by the Duke. Guy Wollstone followed in his father's footsteps by entering the Duke's service. Richard of York's widow, Cecily Neville, continued to live at Fotheringhay Castle after her husband's death at Wakefield in 1460 and her son Edward's accession to the throne in 1461. She may have been responsible for Guy Wollstone's appointment in 1464 as constable, constable of Fotheringhay and keeper of Fotheringhay Great Park. This is a, um, a detail from a map of 1641 which shows, um, shows Fotheringhay, the church uh, and, and the castle and um, part of the, the Great Park. The award of these important and lucrative offices is evidence of the esteem in which Wollstone was held by the Yorks. The reference to an award, in, the reference to the award in the patent rolls, which is the earliest known documentary reference to Guy Wollstone, specifically acknowledges the service rendered by him to the king and his father. Whether this service was administrative or in a military capacity or both is unknown. In the role of constable, Wollstone must have played a significant part in the king's substantial building works of 1463-9 at the castle and in hosting a visit by Edward IV to his family home in 1469. It's possible that Wollstone and his family were accommodated in the castle in the period 1464-70, but there's no firm evidence for this. In 1466, Wollstone was likely to have had personal contact with Edward IV, whose portrait, incidentally, is on the wall to my left, um, <coughs> when Wollstone was made an usher of the chamber. This was an important office, which with three other gentlemen ushers reported to the Chamberlain, William Lord Hastings, the senior figure in overall charge of the chamber. Gentlemen ushers were usually members of the gentry, probably employed on a rota basis to perform a range of duties, including attending at mealtimes, keeping records of food, drinks, fuel and lighting brought into the chamber, training the chamber's servants and allocating lodgings and places at table according to a strict order of precedence. Guy Wollstone's chance to establish his own family seat and estate came in 1468 when he received a grant from the Crown of 270 acres and rather delightfully the rent of one rose flower, presumably a white rose. Um, this land was described in the Charter as in Hale by Apthorpe. And this is the uh, a larger version of the um, uh, a bigger view of that map um, and um, here we have uh, Apthorpe, Apthorpe. Um, and this is the site of um, down here is the site of the um, village of disused or um, abandoned village of Hale. Um, so ha Hale um, was actually um, about one mile south of Apthorpe, Apthorpe, and from this description, it can be inferred that the bulk of the land lay between, uh, making up that 270 acres, lay between Hale and Apthorpe, it's in the village of Apthorpe, and that it encroached on the southern outskirts of the village. Just why Wollstone was granted the land is unknown. But it may have something to do with a change of regime at Fothering Hay in 1469, when the king's mother moved to Berkhamsted in Hertfordshire and handed over the castle to Edward IV. This may have resulted in Wollstone losing his accommodation at the castle, assuming that's where his wife and two daughters were courted, and consequently the need to find somewhere to live close by. Although Lord Hastings was appointed as steward and surveyor of the castle in 1469, this is unlikely to have affected Wollstone's role, as he was confirmed as constable later in that year. Throughout the 1460s, and for much of the remainder of his life, Wollstone held a number of important positions that confirmed his place among the county's gentry. These included serving as a justice of the peace 
for Northamptonshire in 1467 to 8, and again from 1472 to 1500, as MP for Northamptonshire from 1472 to 5, and as Sheriff of the County in 1468 to 9, 1487 and 1491. He was described as of Apethorpe in 1472, by which time the core of his new house was likely to have been built. So this new house was not entirely on a greenfield site. Limited excavations in the main courtyard of the house in 2007 revealed the presence of pottery fragments dating from the mid-12th century to the beginning of the 15th. Analysis of the fragments shows them to be of a fairly common type associated with domestic habitation and there was little evidence of high status pottery that one would expect to see uh, if it was a manorial site. Furthermore, the excavations revealed a one metre thick wall running approximately north-south and which probably formed the footings of a tall single storey or low two-storey building. Um, and this is that wall here and there's a cross wall running across that way. This is uh, an early 17th century drain um, leading to a soakaway of the same date there. <coughs> From the pottery and the wall footings, it's reasonable, reasonable to assume that the building or buildings was part of a southerly continuation of the village street, which was cleared away by Wollstone to make way for his new house. The absence of pottery fragments dating from after the early 15th century suggests that these early, earlier buildings may have been in a ruinous state by the late 1460s. So to help you get your bearings, this ground plan shows in light blue the surviving elements of Wollstone's house in relation to the current footprint of the house as a whole. It was approached through the, from the north through the gatehouse here, flanked by lodging ranges to uh, east and west, here and originally there. And perpendicular to that, so here is the uh, Great Hall um, and associated buildings. Uh, it, had, it was an upper end uh, cross wing here. Um, which incorporated a parlour and secure cellar on the ground floor and a great chamber above. And at the low end of the hall, in this area, was the buttery and pantry in the usual position, with a chamber above that. And beyond that, uh, offset in this position, uh, was the kitchen, <coughs> with some domestic offices to the left of that. <coughs> to the west, here, framing the kitchen court or west court is a two-storey ten-bay service range which we've seen an illustration of, tree ring dated to circa 1476, probably with a dairy, wash house, bake house and brew house on the ground floor and servants' sleeping rooms on the first floor. To the south of the hall cross wing was a tall detached building, probably a high status lodging tower, which is this structure here. The kitchen court was enclosed on three sides by buildings with the south side left open. The east side of the main courtyard, so here, may have been open in Wollstone's day or perhaps enclosed by a low wall until the construction of the current east range in 1622 to 4. So this is, this is a reconstruction of the ground plan, ground plan of the house by the time of Wollstone's death in 1504. This first phase of work carried out in the period from around 1470 to 1480 uh, is in pale blue. As Wollstone is recording as, recorded as living here in 1472, we can surmise that the hall, upper end cross wing and services, including the kitchen, are likely to have been in place by that date, with the other elements coloured pale blue, such as the west service range of about 1476 and the south lodging range, built within a few years of that. Though many of the oak timbers used in the construction of this first phase of buildings were grown too fast to be suitable for dating, crucially, we did manage to get a precise felling date of 1469 for a floor joist in the chamber at the low end of the hall. Other joists provided results that comply broadly with this date and are of similar scantling and appearance. 
The hall was entered from the main courtyard to the east by a two-storey stone porch. This had an opposing two-storey porch at the other end of the screen's passage on the west side of the hall. So there's the east porch and this is the opposing west porch. <coughs> Opposed porches are rare, most halls having, most halls having only one. Well, there are known to be two or three examples with opposed porches. The west porch seems to have been constructed to connect the great hall with the kitchen, which was located on the north side of the courtyard, created by a screen wall. The screen wall is here. So you have this courtyard here, which is the west porch. <coughs> and this, this little court here um, separated... Um, the main service court from the more sort of um, private domestic area uh, close to the hall. Thus the porch would have been the only way of getting the food from the kitchen to the hall. An open air servery court, perhaps provided with some protection from the elements by a wooden pentis, most probably existed in the area between the west porch and the kitchen. Examples of other unroofed servery courts of this period included Gainsborough Old Hall, Lincolnshire, of circa 1480, and that adjoining the late 14th century kitchen at Aspie de la Zouche Castle in Leicestershire, which is the seat of William Lord Hastings. There were two doors at the low end of the hall, one opening on to a buttery or pantry, the other possibly to a passage leading through to three rooms of identical proportions on the ground floor of the northwest lodging range, where upper servants may have been accommodated. So um, this is this area here. The passage may also have connected to a stone vice or spiral stair in the angle between the east porch and the low end services, and that provided access to the chamber over the buttery and pantry. So the suggested position of this low end stair is here. The area where the buttery and pantry was has been heavily altered, so the arrangement shown in this drawing uh, is very much hypothetical. There is no fabric evidence for the position of the low end stair, and the area of wall adjoining the east porch was removed in the 1620s to make way for a bay window. However, in the absence of any evidence, the area adjoining the east porch seems as good a place as any for it. The low end stair, stair at nearby Neville Holt in Leicestershire was built in precisely this position in the mid-15th century. At the upper end of the hall on the east side, there was originally a projection, later replaced by an oriel, leading to a stair providing access to the great chamber over the parlour in the cross wing. The parlour was originally a single large room with a secure cellar or strong room at its west end. Some 12 metres to the south was the detached three-storey lodging tower. And this is all that remains, this uh, structure here, of the lodging tower. It once extended further in this direction uh, and also in that direction. And it's been um, built around by later buildings. The upper section of the um, lodging tower has also been heavily modified. There was originally one large room on each floor, heated by a fireplace in the north wall, and connected by a spiral stair in the northwest corner. Extensive alterations to this part of the house make it very difficult to understand, but it's likely to have comprised Wollstone's finest lodgings for his family or honoured guests, and to have afforded views out over the landscape. Whether there were gardens on the south side of the house in the late 15th century is unknown. This is an elevation of the hall looking from the main courtyard. Uh, and so here we have the east porch, um, the hall here, um, and this is uh, what's called the, the this is a, a later parlour wing, which I'll talk about uh, um, shortly. Um, interesting to point out this bay here, uh, which was added in 1620, but in a style that respect, respects um, and is very similar to the sort of 15, um, sort of late 15th century work, uh, and it seems to be a very early example of sort of deliberate antiquarianism. Uh, and that's one of the themes that exists throughout the history of the house as it happens. The parapets that you see here are all later and the um, sort of ogee shaped gables um, uh, date from the early 17th century. 
Wollstone's work was constructed of local oolitic limestone with rubble facings and ashlar coins. Only one or two expanses of walls, such as the hall porches and the flank elevations of the gate tower, were of square-cut ashlar. The rest of the external walls may have been rendered, as the main facade, that's the north elevation of the north range, was rendered, inscribed with masonry lines and lime-washed, and fragments of this treatment are trapped behind additions dating from the 16th century. Much of the ashlar work that one sees uh, in this slide here, actually, though, um, is much later in date. It's a later refacing. Wollstone employed local masons, as there are many parallels that can be drawn with other buildings in the area, showing that the 15th century masonry work was firmly rooted in the secular and ecclesiastical traditions of this region. However, there are one or two features of the masonry work that are advanced for their time, reflecting some knowledge of latest fashions and perhaps indicating some familiarity with the new works recently undertaken for the king at Fotheringhay. An example is the use of arched window heads with hollow spandrels and an absence of cusping, uh, and you can see that um, in the uh, hall windows here on the east side of the hall. Um, and I, I put this slide in a Great Shellfield Manor, which was built at roughly the same time, um, but slightly later, um, where the hall windows are uh, slightly more old-fashioned um, in terms of their more traditional appearance with sort of wide tracery. So um, these uh, window heads that one sees at Apethorpe um, were employed in brick buildings at Eton and at Queen's College, Cambridge in the 1440s, but they weren't widely employed in stone-built houses until later in the 15th century or even early in the 16th century. The hall is relatively modest in its proportions and resta restrained in its decoration. It measures 35 and a half feet long by 20 feet wide and is smaller than some Northamptonshire great halls, such as the slightly later examples at Boughton and at Forsley, but fairly typical for its time. It consists of four bays with cambered arch brace collars and three tiers of plain wind braces. <coughs> On the right is a, a detail of a fine late 15th century door, um, which has been in a number of positions in the house, but um, it's now um, linking between the east porch and the main entrance to the hall, um, and it may well be its original position. The hall was lit by continuous banks of windows set high up in the east and west walls. It was originally heated by means of an open hearth closer to the low end, and the window in the centre of the west wall, uh, you can see here, there was once a window there, but that's been blocked by insertion of a mural fireplace in the 16th century. There was a second service door, roughly in this position, uh, which has been blocked by that um, later panelling there. There's likely to have been an earlier gallery um, over the screen's passage. Um, this, this particular one dates from the late 17th century. In terms of its decoration, the hall appears very plain and devoid of colour, but in the late 15th century, the windows may have incorporated heraldic glass, while the large areas of wall below the windows could have been panelled. They may also have been enlivened with hangings. If one adds to that furniture, such as the trestle tables and benches, and also a canopy or hanging over the dais at the upper end of the hall, the space would have looked very different. The original parlour on the ground floor of the cross wing was lit by multi-light mullion windows in its south and west walls and accessed from a doorway in the southeast corner of the hall. So, section through the hall. Um, that little feature there, incidentally, so this is looking towards the low end. This little feature here is actually a squint, um, which um, enabled one, uh, someone in the, in the chamber over the buttery and pantry um, to, to look down into the hall from the seated position. The 
The original appearance of the great chamber on the upper floor of the cross wing is unknown, as the roof and ceiling were replaced within 10 to 15 years, and the room was later subdivided into two. We know it was originally accessed from a short-lived stair in the northeast corner of the cross wing. The parlour and great chamber were most probably heated by fireplaces later removed in the centre of the south wall of the wing. Um, this is the um, evidence for the block stair that originally led up to the great chamber. Um, and there was an earlier stair tower here, uh, which was later replaced by this, um, this oriel bay. Um, and this is the moulded doorway that led through um, from the hall into the original parlour. And you can see the slight step up there and there, um, and that reflects the height of the dais, which has been removed from this part of the, of the hall. The three-storey gate tower in the centre of the North Range was flanked by two-storey lodging ranges and formed an impressive entrance into the main court. The sculptural decoration on the north face of the tower is all later. Overall, the tower is smaller and less overtly defensive than Wollstone's brother-in-law, Sir Richard Sapcoats, near contemporary gate tower with its machicolations and crenellations at nearby Elton Hall. And you can see that gate tower on the right. The ceiling over the archway of the gate tower at Apethorpe is comprised of plaster panels with a grid of moulded wooden ribs. Above the archway was a high-status groin-vaulted chamber lit from the north by a three-light window and from the main court by an oriel. So this is this space here with the vaulted ceiling. Um, that's the oriel. This is the main courtyard side and that's the main northern approach. The chamber seems likely to have formed part of the suite of first floor rooms making up the northwest lodging range. The room at the top of the tower could only have been accessed from a polygonal stair turret attached to a southeast corner. So you can see that here. This room retains its late 15th century fireplace, one of only two from the Wollstone period to survive in the house. And there it is there. The restricted access and the vaulting to the room below, which would have provided both security and fireproofing, suggests that this room at the top of the gate tower may have functioned as a muniment room. The northeast lodging range at Apethorpe was demolished in the 1740s, so that's the section to one, the, to one side of the gate tower, and replaced by a tall library block that is of the same size as the gate tower and diminishes its impact from the main approach. But this um, reconstruction drawing by Reverend Bonney, um, dating from about 1828, um, is his assessment of how the house might have looked from when viewed from the north uh, in medieval times. And here we can see um, the original, his interpretation of how that original lodging range, later replaced by a uh, library in the 1740s, would have looked. And you can see the prominence that the gate tower would have had at that time. The lodgings faced inwards and the stacks and guard robes of the lodgings, uh, and there's an example there, uh, were on the outer um, face of the building. The surviving northwest lodging range, which extended across the north end of the hall range as far as the kitchen, has been much modified. While the three rooms on the ground floor may have been used to accommodate members of the household or upper servants, the three first floor chambers, or four if one counts the gate tower chamber, seem to have been of higher status and may have been used by family members or guests. The survival of a late medieval stone jam, door jam at first floor level between the two easternmost rooms may indicate they were linked and formed a discrete apartment. This is the roof over that northwest lodging range. Um, the, first, the three first floor rooms had shallow pitched plaster ceilings which were suspended from the collars of the roof trusses and one can see the outline of that um, pitched ceiling there on the end wall. Wollstone's career continued to prosper throughout the 1470s and into the 1480s. At the funeral of Edward IV in 1483, he assisted in bearing the king's remains into Westminster Abbey to lie in state 
and later to St George's Chapel, Windsor, for burial. He was busy acquiring more land in the Apethorpe area, and by 1484 he was engaged in activity as a merchant in London, in which capacity he was involved with several others in financing a ship for Richard III. From a document of 1487, we learn that Woolston was keeper of areas of woodland called Sulhay Firmes, or, or Firmes means walks, as I understand it, and another area called Shortwood, and these lay two miles to the northeast of Apethorpe. Uh, so this is Sulhay Firmes, this area of woodland, and the actual um, lodge building is, is here. Um, these were lucrative offices associated with the administration of woodland areas within the Bailiwick of Cliff. And according to a document of 1551, Woolston was responsible for bu building Sulhay Lodge up in this spot here. Woolston seems to have survived the fall of the House of York and accession of Henry VII reasonably well, perhaps being too low down the pecking order to be considered a threat to the new regime. Wollstone fought with Henry VII at the Battle of Stoke Field near Newick in 1487, which seems to have brought him favour, as later that year he was made a Knight of the Bath at the coronation of, of Elizabeth of York, the eldest daughter of Edward IV. This was a fitting honour for a loyal servant of the Queen's father and grandfather. Wollstone's first wife, Margaret, had died in 1476, and around 1483 he married a widow, Elizabeth de Wolsey, who died just after 1488, when he, re when he married his third wife, another Margaret. The name of her family is unknown, but she was evidently someone of some, of some status, since the daughter she bore with Sir Guy, Ethelreda, or Audrey, was appointed their principal heir, effectively disinheriting the two daughters from Wollstone's first marriage. His increasing affluence, coupled no doubt with the desire to expand the house to accommodate enlarged and up-to-date lodgings for his new wives, resulted in additions in the 1480s. The precise dates of the additions are unknown, but the relative chronology of the changes can be determined from an investigation of the fabric. Chief among these changes was the addition of a two-storey parlour wing, which is this brown section here, uh, added in the space between the south side of the hall cross wing and the south lodging tower. This contained a new parlour and perhaps a second room on the ground floor and two lodging chambers on the first floor. The alignment of the new wing was skewed to the southeast to enable it to meet with the angled north wall of the lodging tower. With the creation of the parlour wing, a partition was inserted in the old parlour to create a lobby leading from the hall to the new parlour. So that's the partition that was inserted. Uh, and effectively, this area, the old parlour, um, this remaining room here was presumably downgraded to some sort of uh, cellarage. Um, and uh, this the lobby then led through from the hall through to the new parlour. The original spiral stair connecting the hall with the great chamber on the upper floor of the cross wing was superseded by a new spiral stair within a tower in the angle between the cross wing and the new parlour wing on its west side. So the original stair to the Great Chamber was there, um, and this is the new stair that, stair that was created um, to link with, um, between the, cha the parlour and the Great Chamber. This new stair tower survives within later accretions. There it is and it's the only part of the house to retain its crenellated parapet. At approximately the same date, the single-storey screen wall that enclosed the servery court, an area on the west side of the hall, was continued in the southerly direction to partially enclose a smaller, more private court or garden for use by the family or important guests. So this is this courtyard here. This is the screen wall continued along in this direction. A stone mullion, mullioned canted bay window afforded a view of the court from the new parlour, while first floor multi-light stone mullion windows overlooked the court from the great chamber and the lodging chambers in the new wing. There were probably two windows on the east side of the parlour wing, including a single storey bay window at its southern end.
This is a general view of the new parlour, which was heated by a stack in its west wall, somewhere down here, which would have been used by the family, and this room would have been used by the family as an informal dining and sitting room, and for the entertainment of friends. Various refurbishments have removed all trace of the original decorative scheme, but its walls may have been panelled. In the late 15th century, the parlour is likely to have been furnished with a bed to allow for its use as guest accommodation, along with some chairs, a table and a cupboard or two. The great parlour, the great chamber on the upper floor of the cross wing would have continued to be used for formal dining and entertaining, but with the addition of the parlour wing, it would have been accessed by the new stair from the south. The gable projection forming part of the new section of screen wall was added to the west end of the cross wing. This contained at first floor level a guard robe and closet opening off the great chamber. The roof of the cross wing was rebuilt and provided with a shallow barrel vaulted ceiling. The plaster was affixed to the undersides of arch braced collars of closely spaced trusses. The treatment of the new ceiling was identical to that of the first floor of the new parlour wing and the evidence in the area where the roof of the new wing joins with that of the cross wing indicates that the two wings were most likely given these new plaster barrel vaults at the same time. None of the original plaster ceilings survive, but it's clear that they form part of an elaborate scheme befitting the function and position of the new lodgings. The two rooms on the upper floor of the parlour wing were most probably Wollstone's bedchamber, probably entered from the great chamber, and another high status chamber, possibly for Wollstone's wife, to the south of the hat. Between around 1485 and 1495, another two-storey wing was added on an east-west alignment between the south lodging block and the west side of the parlour wing. So here. This southwest lodging wing may have formed a suite for Wollstone's second or third wife, and rooms for the lady of the house are known to have been in this position from the early 17th century onwards. The new wing enclosed the small court on its south side and extended out to the screen wall to the west. It consisted of a larger heated room closest to the parlour and a smaller unheated room beyond that at each level. The first floor accommodation is likely to have comprised a bedchamber and closet, while the ground floor rooms must have functioned as some sort of private and formal space off the parlour. The final significant alteration made by Wollstone in the late 1480s or early 1490s was the addition of a canted oriel window to the east side of the dais to emphasise this symbolically important end of the hall. It replaced an earlier stair tower in roughly the same position. That it was added later is apparent from a watercolour of 1846 by Rudge, which shows it cutting across the blocked window of the original stair leading to the great chamber. Also, its roll moulded mullion and transom windows are different in their detail and it has miniature buttresses which extend down through the plinth. It once had a ribbed timber ceiling with central pendant, which is likely to have been a later insertion and was removed in the early 20th century. And that ceiling was recorded in this country life photograph dating from the end of the 19th century. Uh, Orioles were added um, in the 1480s to a number of other important houses uh, at that time, including, for example, Lincolnshire Old Hall and also at Neville Holt. This is a reconstruction of how Wollstone's house is likely to have looked when viewed from the west at the time of his death in 1504. Sections of the screen wall have been cut away to show, uh, to give views into the two courtyards. From left to right we see the kitchen, um, the west porch and hall. Um, here's the uh, cross wing um, with the um, added projection containing the guard robe. Um, here is the new stair and new parlour wing um, with this private um, garden court. Um, here's the slightly later uh, lodging range and here is the uh, south lodging tower. At his death in 1504, Wollstone had amassed an estate of some 1300 acres in Apethorpe and the surrounding area plus 80 messages and a mill together with land holdings elsewhere in the East Midlands and beyond. 
He is presumed to have been buried under the south wall of the chancel of St. Leonard's Church in the village, as requested in his will. Though as this part of the church was later removed to make way for the addition of the Mildmay Chapel, this cannot be confirmed. In 1498, Wollstone and his wife Margaret agreed a marriage settlement between their daughter Audrey, who must have been aged about nine at that time, and Thomas Empson, eldest son and heir of Richard Empson, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and a member of Henry VII's council, and he's shown on the left-hand side in this painting. Richard Empson was an influential figure and someone with a sizeable estate in the south of the county centred on Eastern Neston. And for Guy and Margaret, the prospect of marrying their daughter into this powerful family must have been an attractive one and a means to securing her future. As it happened, nothing came of this alliance. Since in a spectacular fall from grace, Richard Empson, who was closely associated uh, with what was perceived to be excessive taxation under Henry VII, uh, was attainted um, executed, and executed for treason by Henry VIII in 1510. Thomas Empson, his son, was imprisoned with his father in the process, and in the process lost any real hope of advancement at court. He and Audrey did not succeed in producing an heir. It was in fact through the line of his daughter from his first marriage, Margaret, that Wollstone became a forefather of one of England's most prominent families, the Earls and Dukes of Bedford. As I hope I've shown, Wollstone's career provides a valuable insight into the lives and fortunes of the Shire gentry in the mid to late 15th century, as well as the extension of royal patronage to their loyal servants by the Yorkist dynasty. It's that blending of Wollstone's position as a member of the county gentry with his service as a courtier with close, close personal links to the royal family that's of particular interest, I think. His aspirations, most evident through his house at Apethorpe and its piecemeal development and expansion over some 30 years, strongly reflect his growing affluence and changing family circumstances. Despite being so closely aligned with the House of York, he showed considerable political dexterity or just a plain old-fashioned ability to keep his head down in troubled times, while adapting fairly seamlessly to the early years of Tudor rule. Most likely to pay off their debts, Thomas and Audrey Empson sold Apethorpe and the associated manors in 1515 to a group of men, including Henry Keeble, alderman of London and merchant of the staple, his son-in-law, William Blount, 4th Lord Mountjoy, and others. The Blounts were staunch supporters of the Tudors, and the fourth Lord Mountjoy was an important courtier, scholar, and literary patron. He was a pupil and later patron of the humanist Erasmus, master of the Mint, and from 1512, Chamberlain to Catherine of Aragon. He served as governor of the city of Tournai in the period 1515 to 17. When he returned from France in 1517, he began to buy up parcels of land in the Apethorpe area, this was presumably to build up an estate in close proximity to Fotheringhay Castle and Manor, which Henry VIII had granted to Catherine of Aragon in 1509. Mountjoy seems to have spent little time at Apethorpe, his principal seat being at Barton Blount in Derbyshire, though he is thought to have remodelled Wollstone's south lodging tower with new floor structures and large new windows on the upper floor. At his death in 1534, Apethorpe in the associated manners passed to his son, Charles, a courtier and patron of learning. Charles Blount made a number of alterations, which are shown in a darker shade of blue. Here and here. Here. Um, principally to improve circulation, he created a two-storey passage in part supported on the single-storey stone screen wall to the west of the hall range. The inner or east side of the passage was supported on wooden posts and was timber framed. Its purpose seems to have been to link the sleeping rooms on the upper floor of the cross wing and parlour wing with the rooms used by the family during the day, which by the 1530s may have been located north of the Great Hall. At first floor level, the passage was accessed from the Great Chamber via a reused stone doorway, while at its northern end it turned to connect with the small room over the west porch and thence with rooms over the buttery and pantry and the upper floor of the northwest lodging range. And here we can, one can see um, the windows um, of that passageway. Um, the middle window has been blocked by this guardrail block, which was inserted in this position in 1570. 
And here we see um, the west porch. Um, this new section of wall was created to carry uh, one side of the passage as it, as it turned on, on at a right angle to link with um, the little chamber above the west porch. And from there, um, along the uh, screen's passage gallery and into the, um, into the chamber over the buttery and pantry area. The servery court that I mentioned earlier in the kitchen were off to this left-hand side here. Uh, passages of the type I've just described were not uncommon from, ar from around 1500 onwards, but surviving examples are rare. The other alteration, the main alterations by Charles Blount was his roofing over of the servery court north of the West Porch. In 1537, Apethorpe win witnessed one of the most dramatic events in its history, when the house and park were raided, raided by a group of 30 armed men, 20 of whom were on horseback. This was the first reference in the docu documentary record to the existence of a house and park at Apethorpe. Uh, and this is again an excerpt from that 1641 map. And here we see Apethorpe is the village. And uh, here's the little park. It's not known if the ringleaders of the raiding party bore a grudge against Blount or his tenants, or whether this was just an act of random lawlessness but the attackers killed nearly all the deer in the park, fired arrows through the glass windows, and took and bound one of the servants of Richard Cecil, who seems to have been renting the house at that time. Richard Cecil, of course, being the father of William Cecil, first Lord Burley. Reports of the raid were sent to Thomas Cromwell, but none of the ringleaders were apprehended, and the reasons for the raid remain a mystery. In 1543, Blount and uh, his father's fourth wife, the Dowager Lady Dorothy Mountjoy, conveyed Apethorpe and associated manors and offices to the king in exchange for a large amount of former monastic property. This was most probably to create a large estate centred on Fotheringhay for Queen Catherine Parr, whose family was from Northamptonshire, and who married Henry VIII in that year. The queen appointed one of her fo footmen as steward of the estate, which following the death of the king passed to Princess Elizabeth, and then in 1551 to Sir Walter Mildmay. So to conclude, how should we regard Wollstone's house? In part because it was inaccessible for a long period. It's not as well known as other gentry houses of the period, such as Great Shellfield in Wiltshire, Gainsborough Old Hall in Lincolnshire, or even Applehampton Hall in Dorset. Nor arguable, arguably does it have quite their charm and detailing. But as one of a relatively small number of double courtyard plan houses of the period, to have remained substantially intact, it deserves comparison with them. Although it has been to an extent obscured by later phases and has lost much of its original interior decoration, it survives in pretty much its entirety and is worthy of further study. The piecemeal enlargement of the house over a 20-year period in the area south of the Great Hall reflects a growing desire for privacy among men of Wollstone's status and a growing specialism, specialism of, roof function in, of room function in the late 15th century. There is still much to be discovered about the early history of the house, and no doubt more will be revealed as further investigation work is carried out by the new owners. Thank you for listening.